Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. And thank you to Europython for hosting me and for uh, you know supporting virtual talk. This is very helpful. So we are going to talk about PyTorch 2.0 and why should you care about PyTorch 2.0. So before that, let's talk a little bit about me. <laughs> Just to clarify, um, I'm not a co-author of this framework. Um, I'm a research engineer at Meta, and my, my work is mostly focused on building lifelong learning agents. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that after the uh, after the talk. But yeah, so so what are we going to talk about? We'll talk about PyTorch 2.0 mostly, but this is what somewhat of the formal agenda going to look like. Now, I'm not really going to talk about what PyTorch is. Uh, I assume uh, people are familiar with that. Just to bring everyone on the same page, it's, a, it's an open source machine learning framework. And it provides NumPy-like arrays with GPU acceleration. It's basically super useful for training deep neural networks. And what differentiates it from other uh, machine learning, deep learning frameworks is the ease of use that it provides. Uh, so back in the day when PyTorch came out, uh, the other frameworks that were available, they were usually compiled frameworks. It was very difficult to debug errors that you would come across when you are training your models. And PyTorch provides what is called a debug mode, which basically means uh, whatever you, you know, whatever network architecture, right? You you run that, and then you get errors which are very easy to uh, to debug through. So much so that uh, there's this famous quote from Andre Karpathy, who's a, a very famous machine learning researcher. Uh, it's a pretty old tweet. But they basically say that, you know, I've been using PyTorch for a few months now, and I've never felt better. Uh, my skin is clear, my eyesight has improved. So this is just a testimonial to PyTorch, or rather PyTorch 1.0. Now, point is, if PyTorch 1.0 was so good, and people were writing these nice testimonials about it, why do we care about PyTorch 2.0? Or, or what led, led to the need of PyTorch 2.0? And I think it can be broken down into sort of three reasons. One is, uh, Deep learning uses GPUs for, for accelerating training, right? And throughout uh, the last couple of years, GPUs have been getting faster and faster. And the default eager mode, which is what PyTorch 1.0 or 1.x family was supporting, was just not able to keep up with the, with the GPUs getting faster. So what was happening is your GPUs would get 2x faster, but your machine learning code would not. And uh, you know performance matters when you're training these systems. The second aspect was, uh, the, the overhead of the framework was becoming more and more evident. So PyTorch was written to a large extent in Python, and um, uh, Python is not as fast as we want it to be. And so there was a the framework overhead. The developers were working around this by pushing more and more of PyTorch Python stuff into C++. So you had PyTorch, but most of it was written in C++, and uh, even that was not enough to take care of this overhead. And the third aspect was, PyTorch code was becoming more and more of C++, which means devs had to do more work. It was slowing down the dev velocity. So all these reasons prompted uh, the developers to take a hard look and, and figure out how to uh, design PyTorch 2.0. And so these are the broad goals of PyTorch 2.0. The, the goal is to make training 30% faster and reduce the memory usage while making sure there's minimal changes to the code or the workflow. And this, this minimal changes to code and workflow is important. You can always make the system faster, but then you can break the UX, which made PyTorch uh, very useful in the first place. So they want to do it while keeping the UX with similar. Uh, they want to make it easier to write a PyTorch backend. A PyTorch backend basically means that I, I write down the machine learning operation that I want to execute, and then I write a system which takes these operations and actually executes them. So this is what a backend refers to in this case. Uh, they wanted to add support for dynamic. They rather, they rather wanted to improve support for dynamic shapes and distributed capabilities, so training models across multiple machines and those kind of things. And the fourth aspect was they wanted more of PyTorch to be written in Python so that more people are able to contribute to it. And we'll see throughout this talk as to uh, how does PyTorch 2.0 fulfill all these goals. Uh, so starting with the performance benefits, uh, before actually I talk about the performance benefits, I want to say PyTorch 2.0 is completely backward compatible with PyTorch 1.x series. In fact, uh, the, the last stable release in the 1.x series was PyTorch 1.13.1, and you could very well argue that uh, PyTorch 2.0 should really just be PyTorch 1.14. Uh, so in that sense, PyTorch 2.0 is fully backward compatible, and to use PyTorch 2.0, you, you you can if you have a PyTorch model, you can start using PyTorch 2.0 without changing any single line of code, and everything would just work. And and you get um, so some of the performance benefits that you start getting are in terms of, for example, implementation of high performance transformers. And transformers are the most standard machine learning architecture that is being used right now. So having faster transformer means that uh, your your machine learning workflows go faster. 
a bunch of other operations have also been accelerated. And this is, again, all just sort of out-of-box performance. You don't change anything. You just install PyTorch 2.0. That's it. Uh, so some of the other operations which have been accelerated are multi-array retention, convolutional transpose operations, and interpolation operations. Um, so, so this is all good, but it turns out just these changes are not enough to get a 30% speed up that the team was targeting initially. And so they introduced something called as torch.compile. And torch.compile is where we'll be spending bulk of the talk, bulk of this talk because torch.compile is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a function which you would be using if you're using PyTorch models to accelerate your models. Uh, Right. So, so what is torch.compile? Torch.compile is basically a function which takes a, a callable and it returns a compiled callable. And the hope is that this compiled, compiled callable would be faster to execute and it would be requiring uh, lesser memory than the underlying function. And so torch.compile can take a function. It can take a neural network. Uh, anything that's a callable can be accepted here. Uh, let's take an example. So uh, I've written this foo function, uh, which is really just taking two tensors, x and y, and it's computing sine of x and cos of y, and it's just adding them together. It's, it's a pretty straightforward function. It's not doing anything fancy. And so, so I have this function, and then I compile this function by calling compile and by calling torch.compile, and I get a compiled underscore foo. The first thing is, the first thing to note is this compiled underscore foo is a drop-in replacement for foo. So wherever you are using foo, you can just start using compile dot, uh, compiled underscore foo, and it, it would just work as it is. Uh, here's just a, a simple assert statement showing that uh, you know it, it gives the exact same output for, for a particular x and y, but in practice, this is going to be the exact same thing. And this compiled foo is going to be much faster in practice and, and will be using much, uh, much less of memory than the, the original foo function. And the, the, the good part is uh, the foo function can have branches. It can have if conditions. It doesn't just have to be a, sort of speak, a, a linear flow of execution. Uh, so you can have branches, and uh, Torch or Compile would be able to handle that as well. So I, I think this this was a big win compared to the previous efforts that PyTorch was doing and some other frameworks were doing in terms of compiling the functions. Uh, and then you just don't you just don't don't have to compile your functions. You can also take a machine learning model, a PyTorch module specifically, and then you can compile that uh, again by calling Torch or Compile. And the compiled model that you get, that's a drop-in replacement for the model that you have. And again, it, it works everywhere. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, the examples that I'm showing you are like, you know, hey, I, I ran it locally and it worked, and uh, that's good, but you know, you, you are not going to be working on my machine. So, so the question is, how do we know if this is widely uh, applicable, or how do we know if Torch compile works very widely, and, and it's not working for these specific examples? So uh, what the team did was they, they took 163 open source models from uh, three popular machine learning libraries and benchmarks. So the libraries that they used uh, were Hugging Face Transformers. So, so those of you who work in natural language processing or, uh, or use Transformers would be familiar with Hugging Face Transformers. That's like the de facto standard library for people to get started. Uh, then there's a library called BestTim, which is a state-of-the-art PyTorch vision model. Uh, so they, they took a bunch of well, 61 models from PIM library. And then there's a, a, a benchmark suite called as TorchBench, which is a set of popular code bases from across GitHub. So they took 56 models from TorchBench. So all in all, they had these 163 open source models. And what the team did was they, they took these models and they just did a Torch short compile of one line change on all of these to see whether Torch short compile works out of the box of these things or not. And the results were quite impressive. First thing is, in 93% of the cases, the all short compile just works. There are no errors, and the model is optimized. In the other 7% cases, there are tweaks and, and additional flags that need to be passed. But in the vast majority of cases, it just works out of the box. And this is what the speed ups look like. Now, a couple of caveats here. Uh, these are somewhat old slides. Uh, uh, or this, this particular result is somewhat old. So it's possible that the newer results are, are with newer additions to Torch short compile. These results have become even better. What exactly are we looking at here? We are comparing the performance of the eager mode, which is PyTorch 1.x CD, against Torch short compile. So you take a model which you wrote using PyTorch 1.x, and then you just compile it. And then you are comparing the average gain, the, the gain in uh, the speed of execution. So, uh, and the last detail is that these experiments or these sort of benchmarks were done on an NVIDIA 800 GPU. I'll come to that bit in a minute. But basically, what you see is roughly 38% speed up on an average on TIM models 
76% on torch bench models, another 52% on hugging face models. And again, all of this just by doing a torch shot compile. That's it, nothing else. Uh, yeah. Uh, the detail about the NVIDIA 800 GPUs. So torch shot compile, it's, it's going to compile your model and then it's going to rely on the GPU to sort of accelerate them. And, and we'll talk a bit about that. But that means it requires sort of more recent hardware to do, the, to do those optimizations. If you have a very old GPU, then those optimizations would not be available. And so in those cases, the torch shot compile would just say that, look, I can't optimize it. I'll, I'll still sort of compile it, but there's not going to be any real performance benefits. But even in those cases, torch shot compile would not fail. It would just sort of throw away a warning saying, look, I can't <laughs> optimize it. So, you know, you're just going to get the same performance as before. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and just to uh, sort of uh, use another testimonial, this is from uh, the primary maintainer of Hugging Fish Transformers, where they, just, where they said that just adding this one single line of code gives them a speed up between 1.5x to 2x. And this is pretty amazing. It's just one line of code, and that's it. That's all you need. Now, uh, one caveat. Now, what I'm showing here is the time it takes for an eager compilation mode, which is PyTorch 1.x, and compile mode, which is you know PyTorch 2. Which is supported in PyTorch 2.0. So I took a standard, I think, a dense net model from um, uh, uh, hugging from PyTorch uh, model hub. And I ran it in the eager mode and in the compile mode. The first thing that you will see is eager mode runtime is uh, is 30 milliseconds, whereas compile is taking 35 seconds. It's it's not what we were promised just now, right? But remember, uh, when you are compiling models, the first pass is going to be expensive because in the first pass, the model is actually being compiled. When you when you do torch not compile, it doesn't really do anything. But when you do the first pass, uh, that's when it optimizes the model. So even though the first run, when you do the first run and when you compare the first run, the numbers would look completely upside down. But then when you run this a, a couple of times, then you will see the difference. Uh, so then you start seeing that when you do this eagle eval, it takes about uh, 0 0.29 to 0 0.3 uh, seconds, whereas in the compile, it takes 0 0.2 to 0 0.19 seconds. And if, if you were to compare the median speed of uh, median time, then you see, uh, oops, sorry, then you see a speed up of about 1.49 percent. So I'm, I'm showing this to say that if you run it for the first time and you're like, hey, my compile model is taking a lot longer, it is expected for the very first run, but all the subsequent runs would be faster uh, when you're using compile. So uh, just a little caveat out of the way. Uh, okay, so so this strikes the first goal. Uh, which was to make training faster and lower the memory usage uh, without change to code or to workflow. The only change that we have introduced so far is Torch or Compile. And really, that's the only change that's going to be there. Uh, the next part, for, for, for the next part, we'll look at how Torch or Compile is working. I'll introduce a few other arguments that Torch or Compile accepts, but that's pretty much it. Uh, okay, so what does behind the scenes look like in this case? Uh, this is how the entire process looks like when torch or compile is called. I'm going to break it down into pieces. Uh, it's not super important to understand how all of this is working, but this is useful to reason about the performance gains because in some cases you might not actually see a, a, a substantial performance gain, and then it's, it's helpful to just sort of know that this is how the process is working and whether the results that you are seeing are matching the intuition or not. So the first part is where you write a function that you want to optimize. So we have got another foo function. Uh, just to quickly describe what this is doing, it takes a tensor x, it runs a convolutional 2D on that, then it applies a batch norm layer. Batch norm is a point-wise operation, and then it applies a ReLU non-linearity, non which is basically a rectifier unit. So these are standard machine learning operations. You do that. The first thing that happens is called as graph acquisition. So what PyTorch does, and we'll talk about these specific things, but Py PyTorch uses a component called as Torch Dynamo, which basically passes the trace. It, it, it looks at uh, the execution of the model and it breaks down this, this function foo into these operations. It says, okay, so there's an X, there's a con 2D, there's a batch norm, and then there's a ReLU. So this is the first step, which is called as a graph acquisition stage. In the second stage, the graph would be lowered. And on all that it means is, sure, con 2D, but how exactly to execute con 2D? Or batch norm, but what exactly does batch norm mean? Or, or ReLU, but what exactly does ReLU mean? So uh, a con 2D is implemented as, for example, you get a weight matrix, you pass it to a con layer, and then you apply a bias. A batch norm is implemented as, you know, you subtract the mean and you divide by the standard deviation. And the ReLU is implemented as a max of the input and zero. So it's breaking down this acquired graph into lower level operations. And the third stage is where the graph compilation happens, where 
so, so you've got the graph, you have lowered it, you have broken it down, and then you're actually comp like actually compiling the graph. And the end result of this is the compiled function that you get out. So there are four main pieces. We would be spending some time on Torch Dynamo. The other things will quickly be basically skimming over because they are sort of very backendish and are not going to change a lot about how you interact with the system. Uh, so yeah, so starting with Torch Dynamo. Torch Dynamo, Torch Dynamo is basically it's a Python level JIT compiler. What it is doing is it's looking into uh, when you execute this graph, it looks into the frames and it extracts the sequence of PyTorch operators. And so just to go back. The sequence of PyTorch operators is what you're seeing here. And this representation, this concode, batch norm, relu, these are PyTorch operators. This is called as an FX graph. The, the name doesn't really matter, but just to say what this is. Um, yeah, and then you, you uh, compile it. So just to show you what this would look like, this is our standard foo function. There's a sign and a false. Uh, I'm probably going to skip over this, but this is just some boilerplate code to show uh, how the graph is being captured. This is what the graph corresponding to this looks like. So you know you've got an X and a Y, which are placeholders. So these are inputs. Then you're applying the sign operation, the cost operation, and then you're adding everything in the output. So the, the graph in this case looks pretty much as you would expect the graph to look like. And uh, Torch Dynamo captures that graph for you. Also, don't worry about the code. Uh, there's a Jupyter notebook at the end, a Colab notebook rather at the end, which has all this code. So uh, you'll have access to it. Uh, and just to take a other quick example, what if the code has got if conditions? Then uh, in this case, it breaks the graph into three graphs. It basically has one graph corresponding to the first statement. Then it has one graph corresponding to the case where b dot sum is less than zero, and another corresponding to b dot sum not less than zero, so greater than or equal to zero. So it, it breaks it down into multiple graphs in this case, basically to show that it handles these cases correctly. Um, yeah, and it also provides a bunch of help helper functions like torch dot and for dynamo that explain, which explains you how it is breaking down the graphs and those kind of things. So for example, in this one, it says, you know, I'm producing one graph, there are no graph breaks, and there are three operations. Okay, sounds good, sounds reasonable. Uh, and then in this case, it's saying there are six operations, but there's one graph break, so you know, there's an if condition. Uh, it just makes it easier to sort of reason through these things. Um, okay, then there's a third thing called as a full graph mode. A full graph mode can be enabled by just sort of passing full graph equal to true when you're doing torch or compile. By default, full graph is equal to false. Uh, so uh, again, a full graph compiled function is also a drop-in replacement. Everything would work as it is. But full graph, uh, there's a spectrum, basically. So so on left-hand side of the spectrum, you have got this eager mode, which was PyTorch 1.8. It's full Python. You do not need any change in the code at all. But there's a lot of framework overhead. You do not get any fusion. You do not get any static analysis. On the other extreme, we have got a full graph, which is a restricted subset of Python. And using full graph would sometimes mean you have to do significant amount of code changes, but full graph compilation is going to be the fastest. And in between, you have got the, uh, the default mode, which is torch or compile with full graph equal to false, which is a default. Uh, it supports pretty much all of Python. There's no code change needed. Uh, and you do get some code fusion and some, uh, some static analysis, but it's not as fast as, for example, full graph mode. So the trade-off is with full graph, You'll, have, you, you'll likely have to do some changes on your code, but with the partial graph, you don't have to do any changes. And, and eager is you know, no change at all. Uh, yeah, so there's some other examples, but I'm probably gonna skim over them. They're just showing, you know, if, if you try to, com full, to compile a function like this, which has got branches, and you try to use full graph, in those cases, it fails with this error that you know, there's a if condition and you need to get rid of that condition. Um, yeah. Okay, so we talked about Dynamo. Uh, the next piece that we'll be talking about is Inductor. Inductor is basically a compiler backend. Uh, Torch Dynamo supports a bunch of backends, but this is one of those. And the way it works is it uses this library from OpenAI called as Triton for generating code for GPU. So basically, it uses Triton to write on uh, to, to generate kernels that are executed on CUDA uh, on, on GPU. Sorry. So instead of having to write CUDA kernels yourself, Triton does it for you. Uh, I'll just show an example of what does. Uh, a kernel look like, uh, but before that, so Torch dot compile, you can pass an argument called its backend, which is inductor. If you don't pass it, it's default to inductor. So, so the thing that I want us to notice is, so we have got three operations here. There's a cos, there's a sign, and there's an a plus b. This is the Triton kernel that inductor generates. And the the thing to look for here is, uh, this is one single kernel. This means this is one single operation that the, the GPU would be executing. 
I think the main thing that I want to show here is if you look at the sign, the two sign operations are now fused together in the sense that they are on the same kernel now. So even though they are written separately, uh, sorry, even though they are written separately, they are part of the same kernel, and being part of the same kernel means they're fused. It's going to require uh, lesser overhead, uh, and, and the execution will be faster. So this is how inductor makes a code go faster. Uh, this also means that now more of PyTorch can be written in Python because you know in, uh, in, in inductor is using Triton, which is generating Python looking like code. Uh, I think I have a slide on Triton. Oh, probably not. Um, yeah. So implicitly, it, it enables you to write more of PyTorch in Python. Uh, there are a bunch of other backends which are also supported. Uh, wouldn't be going over them uh, just in trust of time. Okay. The next piece is called a uh, PrimTorch. So what, what, what's the idea behind PrimTorch? Uh, so in PyTorch 1.x land, uh, there were almost like 2,000 plus operators, and uh, so if someone wanted to implement a backend for PyTorch, they had to re-implement these 2,000 operators, and that's a lot of work. Uh, why do we have 2,000 operators? Well, because we want the operations to be faster. So in some cases, they would fuse the kernels together. They would write, they would by hand write a new kernel, and that would become a new operator. Uh, PrimTorch is an effort where they are trying to reduce the number of the 2,000 plus operators to something like 250. And then anyone who wants to re-implement a backend for PyTorch would just have to rewrite these 250 operators. It's somewhat of a work in progress, uh, but Inductor makes it possible because now you can have these 250 based primitive operators. You can compose them, and Inductor would make sure that it goes fast. And PrimTorch, uh, yeah, PrimTorch basically makes it easier to write a, a PyTorch backend. The last piece is called as AOT Autograd. Uh, again, we wouldn't be going too much into it, but basically when you're using these libraries for machine learning, you want an Autograd engine. So PyTorch 1.x already had an Autograd engine, and for 2.0, they decided to sort of repurpose it. So what they introduced is called as AOT Autograd or an ahead of time Autograd. What it basically does is when Torch or Dynamo captures your graph during the forward call, um, it also generates a corresponding backward segment. And so when you call backward for your model, backward is basically computational gradient. So when you call backward, uh, the, the compiled graph for the backward mode is already available and it's it just executed. And that's why it's sort of ahead of time. Um, okay, so again, AOT Autograd makes it easier to support dynamic shapes, uh, distributed capabilities, and sort of, you know, taking all these things together, it makes it, it also makes it easier to write PyTorch backend because you don't have to worry about how the backward calls are working. Uh, all in all, all these things that we looked at so far, the four pieces, they uh, satisfy all the four conditions that we had for PyTorch 2.0. Um, just to wrap up the torture compile piece, uh, so this is what the full signature looks like. Uh, the first thing, uh, so we, we already talked about a bunch of things. We talked about what backend does. We talked about what full graph does. Uh, let's talk a bit about what mode does. Mode, there are three different modes for now. Default mode is, you know, default mode will try to compile it, try to compile the model quickly without taking too much time or memory. Then there's a mode called as reduce overhead, which tries to reduce the framework overhead as much as possible, but it might increase the memory consumption. And then there's something called as max auto tune, which takes a lot of time to compile, but it will try to give you the fastest code possible. So really, it's a trade-off between how quickly you want the model to be compiled, and in what sort of you know what properties do you want the model to uh, to the compiled model to have. Uh, this is pretty much it. Um, what's coming up in 2.x series? There are going to be more updates to Torch compile. Uh, there is uh, the support for distributed tensors coming in. Tensor parallel, 2D parallel. These are different distributed training uh, techniques. I wouldn't be covering them as part of this, uh, but feel free to ask questions on this. And these are a bunch of resources to, to learn more about what I just talked about. Uh, thank you so much. And the slides and the talk, uh, the, the notebook are available at this link. Uh, with this, I'll stop. And this is a good time to ask questions. Super. Thank you very much. We have five minutes to questions. Uh, please queue up or ask your questions in the Discord if you are remote. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'm gonna ask like short question. Like, what do you think your personal best, like, favorite feature would be uh, in not this release but the next one? I'm really looking forward to distributed tensors. Uh, so a lot of job, a lot of work that I do is basically training these models fast enough and and. Uh, it, 
uh, the, the kind of bottlenecks for the overheads that we run into is the, the communication cost when you're talking to different GPUs across different machines. Uh, so the hope is distributed tensors uh, and tensor parallel effort, you know, which are basically prioritizing all the distributed efforts would just make that go faster. So that's the piece that I'm most excited about uh, in the upcoming releases. Started compile was also great, great help. Uh, again, out of the box performance, 1.5x to 2x performance is what I've been consistently seeing across all my models. I have a weak question. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, in your opinion, uh, how we can reduce this uh, cold start of uh, compilation? If this, there are, are any techniques or that you are aware of? Uh, cold start of compilers. Uh, what, what what specific piece are we I mean, to? I mean, the time that the compiler takes. Yeah, I mean, uh, is there any any facilities to to pre-compile or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a it's a trade-off between you know how much you want the how much do you want the code to change versus how how you know how you how much of the UX you want to remain unchanged. So for example, uh, if if the compiler already knew the shapes that it's the yeah, yeah let's just go back to an example because then it will make it more explicit. Yeah. So let's say we have this example. If the compiler already knows what the shape of X and Y could be, then it has a lot more information and it can cut down the search space where it's trying to optimize this. Uh, and on top of that, if it knew, for example, X is always going to be an end, then it can generate an even more specialized kernel, again, by cutting down into those kind of subspaces. Uh, whereas in this case, it's like, you know, we look at X and then we'll just, then we would determine uh, what, what kind of a kernel to write down, especially when you throw in branches. In that case, uh, you know, if when you compile it for the first time, it goes through a particular branch, then, you know, that branch is going to be passed subsequently. But if you go through the second branch in the next time, then this is sort of the cold start problem again. Uh, so maybe you can compile them both, or or you can break down your code so that it doesn't have branching or break conditions. Uh, yeah. So I, I see this as a spectrum. How, how much do you want? How much work do you want the user to do uh, to make the compilation process faster versus uh, how much you are you know you want to have a nice UX, even if that means the compiler is a bit slow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have time for maybe one question. Um, on the Discord, it's the channel North Hall, if you had anything right now, or are we going to finish? Okay, um, thank you very much. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you.